lecture series. Uh, Fred founded the American Action Forum. Uh, we turned five in January, and it seemed appropriate to recognize his contributions in a lasting way. And so we've named this lecture series uh, after Fred, our founding uh, chairman of the board. It will convene roughly every two months and is dedicated to the investigation into effective public policy. And in that way, it shares the spirit of the American Action Forum, which is dedicated to the notion that ideas are important, that the facts on the ground are important, but unless those turn into actual effective public policy, uh, it's not enough. And so action is important, and we're pleased today to uh, open this lecture series and have uh, present uh, the man for whom it is named, and we're delighted to have Fred here. Please. Thank you. Get him, Fred. Um, I'm going to start by spending about 30 minutes on explaining what the American <laughs> Forum, <laughs> Action Forum is. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce Scott, but before I do that, I, I would like to compliment uh, Doug and the American Action Forum, just say a word on, their, uh, in, on them. Uh, I founded this with the idea that we needed to bring together the policy ideas from the right to the moderate, formulate it in a way that's understandable to the American people and is compelling to the American people. I must say, Doug, it's far exceeded any expectations I had. It has been a phenomenal, phenomenal success, thanks to you, thanks to your team, um, as I like to say, you fought way above your weight and had a powerful influence, I think, on policy formulation in this country. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about Scott Walker's accomplishments as governor or his biographical background because you all have that in your handouts or have it in your knowledge. Let me just tell you about why I think Scott Walker is a terrific leader and why I'm so pleased to have him here to open this, this series of talks today. About six years ago, I was at a forum and Scott Walker was the county executive. I think it was in Sun Valley. And he was there as a competitor for the nomination for governor of Wisconsin. He was county executive of Milwaukee County. Well, I asked to get some information about Scott Walker and somebody gave me some background on him and I learned that as county executive, he had been elected twice, or three times, twice? Uh, one special, two regular, yep. Uh, in Milwaukee County. Now, Milwaukee County, being the county executive of Milwaukee County is a big deal. I mean, it's a big county. It's the city and the whole environs of it. And when I looked at the record of what he had done, he had cut taxes, he had cut expenses, he had improved education, and he was elected by a 20-point margin in a very, very blue county. And then we looked at the results from the 2008 election. Barack Obama carried that election over McCain by 20 points. Scott Walker won his election by 20 points. And I thought, this guy must have some kind of magic. I really hope he gets the nomination and goes on to the next stage. But if he does, it's going to be a whole different ball game when he's trying to do this one in the whole state. Well, not only did he get elected, but he did exactly what he said he would do. Now look, I'm a businessman. I admire people who look you in the eye and say, this is what I'm going to do, and then they go out and do it to the letter. And they have the ability not only to talk about it, but to get it done and to execute against that. That's what he did as governor. He paid a big price for that. He had to run again in 2000 and, uh, 2012. Uh, where he won again. So I guess what impresses me most about this governor, this young governor, is he says what he's going to do, follows through, and gets it done. He has the courage to withstand the pressures that come against him. And as a West Pointer and former Green Beret, I would say I like to use this analogy. I want somebody as my leader in political office to be somebody I would want in a foxhole in a firefight. I can't think of anybody I'd rather be in that foxhole with in a firefight or under stress than Governor Scott Walker. Scott. Thanks, Fred. Thanks. <laughs> well, thanks, Fred. And, and uh, boy, that's, that's a high compliment, as you said, coming from somebody from West Point with your leadership, uh, both your military experience, uh, your business experience, and uh, your leadership in so many ways. 
Um, Fred and Marlene have been good friends to Tonette and I for some time. And, and I think about, you mentioned 10 and 12 and 14. I uh, appreciate your help and assistance, not only for me, but I think of people like Susanna Martinez, John Kasich, Rick Snyder, Nikki Haley, Mary Fallon, and the list goes on and on. Uh, leaders all across this country at the state level who arguably many of those leaders wouldn't be in place, myself included, without your leadership, and that uh, we very much appreciate that. And, and Doug, thank you. Uh, not only your leadership here, but in the past when I was involved with the, and still am now involved with the National Governors Association, but we've, we've had uh, you appear with us and share information with us. We appreciate your leadership here as well and appreciate the opportunity to share in this, in this uh, first of the series, uh, which I'm sure there will be uh, many other great speakers to come. Uh, today, it's kind of interesting, thinking about being here. I came in late last night, and i got to tell you, I, I, I love, even though I've been here plenty of times before, I love coming in particularly at night because now that, that things have safened up enough that uh, you can come in from the north into Reagan. It's beautiful at night coming over, uh, the seeing the National Cathedral and then coming along Potomac and seeing the Kennedy Center and seeing the, looking down the mall and seeing the Lincoln and the Washington and the Jefferson Memorials, and it's just, there's something wonderful about coming in fresh uh, to our nation's capital. And uh, over the years, that's never I've never lost that, looking at those great monuments and thinking about the great leaders of our time here in this country. Uh, but I gotta tell you, as much as I love coming here, I love going home even more. Uh, not just because I love Wisconsin, but because I, in many ways, I, I think with uh, respect to many of the people here are fighting to try and change that uh, with this organization and others like that, but for a lot of folks here in our nation's capital in Washington, there's kind of a dome. In fact, I like to call it 68 square miles surrounded by reality. Uh, and in many ways, there's a big difference between Washington and the rest of the country. Uh, and so today, part of what I want to talk about is that contrast, not just between Washington and Wisconsin, but I think Washington and the rest of America. And what I see here, and I've seen for years, but even more so now in the, the last few years, uh, under this administration, is a place where in Washington, it's kind of this top-down, government knows best. It's a tired old approach that hasn't worked in the past and I don't think will work in the future. And what I see in the states and from the people of this country outside of Washington is a craving for something new, for something fresh, for something dynamic that says instead of the top-down, government knows best approach that we've seen too long in Washington, we want something that's built up with big, bold ideas uh, from not only states but from local communities all across this country. In a way, it's part of why we talked this last week about our American revival is our next step in making the case that we, to transform America, need to really transfer power, power from our nation's capital here in Washington back to the states and the cities of this country where, where the people, where the hardworking people of this country can actually hold their government accountable at the state and local level much more so than they can in Washington. I think the people of this country want a more effective, a more efficient, a more accountable government and they'll get that when more of that power is transferred from Washington out to the states and ultimately to the people. And, and so in Wisconsin, we're a great example of that. As Fred alluded to, you know, we took on over the past four years the big government special interests, many of whom are based right here in our nation's capital. I mean, you think about it. Four years ago, about at this point, you saw many of the leaders of the AFL-CL, the NEA, AFSCME, and other organizations on the left came to our state to try and intimidate us to do what they wanted to have done here in Washington, not what the people of Wisconsin had elected us to do. And we won. Part of the reason why they were so upset, again, even this last fall, why it was the number one target in America in terms of a reelect for many of those same organizations was because they were upset that we took their power away. We took the power away from the big government special interest here in Washington and elsewhere around the country, and we put that power firmly in the hands of the hardworking taxpayers. And I believe that's why even in Wisconsin, a state that hasn't gone Republican for president in more than 30 years since I was in high school in 1984, that's a state that we've won not once, not twice, but three times in, in the last four years. In a state where we not only face tremendous challenges and money run against us in the recall election, but faced some of those same challenges uh, this last fall in the re-election for governor. And we were able to win not only on elections, but I think more importantly, we won on policy. And I, you know, you can, there's a number of examples, and I assume we're going to take some questions in a little bit as, as part of Doug and Fred joining me here on a panel. We'll talk in greater detail about some of these, but, you know, we've seen tremendous turnaround when it comes to the economy in our state. We've seen it with our financial situation uh, in terms of the stability we restored. We've seen it with innovations in health care uh, in, in other areas as well. But I want to tell you two quick stories 
about two areas that I think reflect the difference between Washington and not only Wisconsin, but the states. One involves a, a young woman named Megan. Now, Megan, uh, more than four years ago, actually at the beginning of 2010, so about five years ago now, uh, Megan Sampson was a brand new teacher in the Milwaukee public school system. Uh, she was one of those great teachers that we would want in any school district across the country, certainly in our state. But she was in Milwaukee, which is like many urban uh, school districts across America, uh, has been continuously challenged. And so Megan uh, was found out early on in 2010 that she was named the Outstanding Teacher of the Year in the state of Wisconsin for English teachers. So she was one of the top teachers out there. Really distinguished honor out there. She found out about that. And not long after, she found out she was being laid off. She was being laid off. Now, this was because under my predecessor, even with Democrats in charge of Wisconsin, they cut money to public schools, but unlike what we did not long after, they gave them no tools to react to that. So what did they do in Milwaukee, like many other school districts across our state, and arguably around the country, when they were faced with tough economic choices and they went ahead with layoffs, how did they do them? They administered them under the old union contract. It said the last hired is the first fired. The last in is the first out. And so Megan Sampson, the outstanding teacher of the year for the state of Wisconsin, was one of the first to be laid off because she was one of the last to be hired in that school district. Our reforms that came about that got the nation's attention with the protests that came because of the early stages of, of that debate, our reforms changed that broken system. Today in Wisconsin, it's not just about balancing budgets. Our Act 10 reforms now empower schools to hire and fire based on merit to pay based on performance, to put the best and the brightest in their classrooms, and to actually have an impact on that. And we've seen great success. In fact, for the last four years, graduation rates have been up. ACT scores are now second best in the country. Third grade reading scores are up. It's more than just talk. We've actually seen action because the people we elect at the local level, at the school district, are now the people in charge. To me, that's a prime example where you take the power away from the big government special interests, in this case, those driven by many here in Washington, and you put it in the hands of the hardworking taxpayers, in the case of schools, the people they duly elect at the local level, you can actually hold your schools accountable. You can hold them accountable to be more effective, more efficient, more responsive to the needs and expectations of the hardworking taxpayers. The other story is about a woman named Elizabeth. About this time, about three or four years ago, um, we uh, were looking at making a change in Wisconsin. Most states across the country even today, most states in this country do not require recipients uh, for things like food stamps to be signed up for employability skills. And so I decided, looking at this and talking to people across the state, that we wanted to make that a priority. We believed that there were jobs available, and even more over the last few years, and that if we were going to provide assistance, particularly for adults without children, we wanted to make sure there was an expectation that even though we'll help you when times are tough, our expectation is that uh, that assistance is a safety net that you bounce out of, not a hammock that you stay in. And so we put in place uh, requirements, uh, we proposed, I should say, requirements that we've now enacted on uh, that would require food stamp recipients in our state, particularly for adults without children, uh, to be enrolled in part of our employability training. We've started out with a pilot, we're expanding it across the rest of the state. But early on when I wanted to make this proposal, I as you might imagine, had a, an address that I gave in front of the joint session of the legislature where we were talking about our budget and our ideas, much like the president did last week. You, know, you, put, you ask people to sit up in the balcony and, and talk about introducing people that relate to the ideas that you have. And, and so I had heard from the folks that work on health and human services for us in the state uh, about this woman named Elizabeth. See, Elizabeth, to her credit, before we even proposed making this a requirement for public assistance, Elizabeth, on her own, had been in tough times, but she knew she didn't want to be that way forever. And so she voluntarily participated in one of our employability programs early on before we made it a requirement. And, and her story is such a great story because she not only completed that, she did so well that they, they plugged her into the local technical college where she got trained as a certified nursing assistant. And so I thought in my address to talk about this and other policy initiatives, before the legislature, I thought, who better than to put Elizabeth up uh, in right down the way from where my wife sat and to introduce her as a part of my speech. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You see, Elizabeth was working that day as a certified nursing assistant, and she liked her job so much she was going back to school as a registered nurse. 
And so the reason I bring that story up is sometimes people, certainly in my capital, but I would imagine here and elsewhere around the country, look at reforms like those that we proposed and say, hey, people like the governor are trying to make it harder to get government assistance. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm trying to make it easier to get a job. And Elizabeth's story is one that we're trying to aspire to all across this country, not just in our state, to say we need to empower state and local governments to put in place innovative solutions that help people meet their full potential. Because, you know, as growing up as a kid, I, I grew up in a small town where my, my dad was a pastor and my mom worked part-time as a, as a secretary and helped raise my brother and I. I learned early the value of hard work. I was a... a, 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 a dishwasher at the Countryside Restaurant. I, I worked for a while in high school flipping hamburgers at McDonald's to save up for college. I think from my parents and those jobs, I learned early on the value of hard work. And, and one of the things I think is missing today is, is not like what I experienced, was that early on in my life, I think for a lot of us, we realized that if you work hard and play by the rules in America, the opportunity should be open to all of us. But the outcome should still be up to each of us individually. And increasingly, I think there are people in this country today who feel those rules don't apply anymore, that, that just having hard work and determination isn't enough because the odds are stacked against them. I think much of that is because the things that we see being driven here in Washington, the massive power that's here in Washington, is taking away from some of those incentives. And we'd be better suited in cases like Elizabeth if we put that power and that structure, in many cases those resources, transferred the power back to the states and back to the local governments where the people in those communities, the people in those states, can ultimately hold their government accountable. There are plenty of other examples, and again, in the discussions, we can talk about that in greater detail. But, but I'm reminded about one of my favorite sayings from President Reagan. There are many great statements out there that are often quoted, but one of mine that I, I think really addresses this particular issue is that in President Reagan's initial inaugural address, he said to the nation midway through, we should all remember that the federal government did not create the states, the states created the federal government. And now more than ever, that's important because I look in many ways, I think president, the president we currently have in the White House almost has a completely opposite view. When I heard his State of the Union address, this sounds like a person who wants to, to grow the economy here in Washington. I think the rest of us in America want to grow the economy in cities and towns all across this great nation. I mean, think about the disconnect. Six of the ten richest counties in America, according to median income, are right here in the, in the uh, Washington, D.C. market. Six of the top ten. To me, that suggests there's a disconnect between those who want to grow government in Washington and the rest of us who want to grow the economy out with real people in cities and towns and villages all across this great country. And so that's where our American revival that we've talked about is really about transferring that power from Washington back to the people, by getting it out to the states and, and ultimately uh, out to the individuals uh, where they can hold their government accountable in a way that, that I think sets the standard for the future. And, and I'll just end with, <clears throat> with this last summary here, and then I think we're going to move the podium and, and bring some chairs up. Years, years ago, I had a chance in September of 2011, uh, not long after I was first in office and some of the big changes we had proposed and made in Wisconsin, I, I had a chance to go to a conference in Philadelphia. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but, but uh, to me it was because, you see, as a kid, I, I loved history. I loved reading about our founders. In fact, in a way I was a little geeky, I actually thought of our founders almost like superheroes, bigger than life. Loved reading about them. But because our family didn't have a lot of money, we had, as a kid, I'd never made it to Washington or Philadelphia or New York or anywhere else. In fact, the first time I came to our nation's capital was because the American Legion had a program called Boys State, and they sent me from Boys State to Boys Nation as one of the two representatives from my state. In fact, it's about the only thing I have in common with Bill Clinton. He went in 63, I went in 85. Uh, you can see maybe where a little bit of those differences are there. Uh, but, but that was a huge difference for us, but it had a tremendous impact for me. But I never had made it to Philadelphia. So in the fall of 2011, Tanette and I had a chance. I was going to participate with other governors at a conference. And because I loved history, and still do today so much, I, I got up early, went over with the park rangers to see the, the Liberty Bell and to go into Independence Hall. Now, mind you, for someone who thought of, the, uh, thought of the founders of this country as bigger than life, going to Independence Hall is like going to the, you know, the League of Nations. I mean, it's like, the, I mean, it's like superhero. You know, this is where they were at. And so I got up early in the morning, right as the sun was coming in, went into Independence Hall, looked around in awe. 
and in a room that's honestly not much bigger than the one we're in right now, looked at the chairs, looked at the desk, looked at the room, and it dawned on me. These were ordinary people. Ordinary people who did something quite extraordinary. They didn't just risk their political careers. They didn't just risk their business ventures. Theirs were ordinary people who risked their lives for the freedoms we hold dear today. Moments like that really put in place for me why America is so exceptional, why this is arguably the greatest country in the history of the world. It's because of people like those who sat in that room, ordinary people who did those extraordinary things and realized that in moments of crisis, crisis in our nation's history, not just then, but throughout times up until now, what has made this country so exceptional has been in those times of crisis, be they economic or fiscal, military or spiritual, what has made America great has been the fact that all throughout that time there have been men and women of courage who have been willing to stand up and think more about the future of their children and their grandchildren than they thought about their own political futures. To me, this is one of those times in our history where we can stand up and say, the way to move this country is, is not just to go back in time. Those were pretty good, ideas, pretty good ideas back then. I think there are even plan and a roadmap for going forward. And if we go back to those, those founding principles that say the power is best vested not in the federal government, but in the states and more importantly in the hands of the people, that's a roadmap for us going forward, whether it's on health care or education or transportation or so many areas. The best way we move this country is by transferring power from Washington out to the hardworking people of this country. Uh, and that's why it's an honor to be here today to talk about that. So with that, I think we're going to move forward and make adjustments and take some questions. Thank you. Now we have a coin toss. Who gets the first question? Well, you're a lot smarter than me, so you ask the first question. No, I, I want to pick up on, on what you said about um, uh, economic success. Mm -hmm. um, I, I looked it up. When you were elected governor, Wisconsin was ranked by the CEOs of America as the 41st best state to do business in. It's now ranked 17th. Mm -hmm. How? Well, a combination of things. I mean, it, I think there's really two categories in government, be it at the state, local, even the federal level, but I think most good decisions in the economy are at the state and the local level, which is why I think you want to transfer power there. But a couple things, two, two, two parallel silos. One, I think more often than not, one of the best things government can do is get out of the way. We lowered the tax burden by $2 billion. In fact, property taxes in my state this past December were lower than they were four years earlier. My budget comes out next week. For the next two years, they'll be even lower than they were when I started. Uh, so I think those things have an impact, putting more money back in the hands of the people as consumers as well as uh, small businesses and other employers. But it's also reigning in out-of-control regulations. What we try to say is what we, we're limited now to enforcing common sense, not bureaucratic red tape. We reigned in on frivolous and out-of-control lawsuits. Uh, so in many areas, it's about getting government out of the way, stopping the barriers, making it easier, particularly for, for young people and folks who want to start a business starting from the ground up to find one stop, to do it quickly and effectively, realizing that people create jobs, not the government. The other part is where I, I do think there's an appropriate role for government to be a partner and a better partner in our case. So we've done more to work with career and technical education. Even though I, I'm really good at reining in spending, I've spent more in, in our technical colleges and some of our apprenticeship and worker training programs because what I heard from employers in manufacturing, uh, in construction, in transportation, in healthcare for that matter, in IT was, there was a tremendous need, not just to fill spots that were open, but if, if we could show that we could fill those spots consistently, uh, they would actually add more work. And, and so we, we've seen great progress. And I'm glad to say, you know, just this past week, unemployment numbers were down again to 5.2% from last month. We look uh, back five years ago, the unemployment rate in my state was 9.2%. The other interesting thing is, as you know, the federal government updates from the previous month in November, we had 18,000 private sector jobs created. That's the best month for job creation we've had in the private sector in 25 years. Wow. 
and it's the best year-over-year -year numbers we've had through November of 13 to November of 14 since the late 1990s. So it's working. There's more to be done, and, and if the government at the federal level would free up even more resources for us, not new dollars, but the resources we have, I think not only for Wisconsin, but for many other states, uh, we could really build off of that. I bet you a lot of those jobs you took from my home state of Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the southeastern Wisconsin, Kenosha County, yeah. uh, which is just uh, kind of halfway between Chicago and, and uh, Milwaukee, has had about, uh, I believe in the last couple of years, there was a story in one of our business journals that showed in about two and a half year period, almost 4,000 new jobs. Many of those were organic, but many others were coming north. Now, Bruce Rauner, I think, will put a, a little stop to that because I'm hopeful that Bruce will do a good job as the new governor of Illinois. But there, that was clearly one of those areas where you could see the push of businesses that said, not just because of the tax climate, the business climate, but just because of stability. Yeah. Uh, my question is this. You took a little bit different approach, kind of a hybrid approach, as I understand mm -hmm. it, to, to um, Obamacare mm -hmm. in your state. And uh, could you kind of explain why you did that and how it's working? Yeah, this is a good example of my overall argument about if you give people power at the state and local level, uh, we are the laboratories of democracy. I think that was something that people thought for many years throughout our history, and I think we're showing it even more so at the state level now. And I didn't accept the false choices that, that often Washington tries to give you between either not taking the expansion of Medicaid, which we didn't, or taking it and putting your taxpayers at risk. What we did in Wisconsin, my predecessor had expanded the eligibility uh, for Medicaid, for health care, for those in need, to twice the rate of poverty. So he said, it's not just, Medicaid isn't just for people living in poverty, it's for people at twice the level of poverty in the state, particularly for those adults without children. A and then, as unfortunately is often done with policies like this, he didn't put enough money into it. So there was a waiting list, literally for people living in poverty, we're in a waiting list to get assistance and access to health care in our state. Because of the Supreme Court's decision, the part of it I liked, the other part obviously I wasn't fond of, but the part of the ruling on the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, that said the states can control their destinies when it comes to Medicaid, uh, we were actually in a great position because what it allowed us to do was to say, we restored Medicaid to what it was intended to be, that is providing access to health care for people living in poverty, and for all those living above that, uh, we transitioned them to the marketplace. That means there's no waiting list in our state. And the Kaiser Family Foundation, which doesn't have a particular political angle one way or the other, at least certainly not a conservative angle, said we're the only state in America that did not take the Medicaid expansion that has no insurance gap. So we, we tried to find common sense, conservative uh, reforms that could work, and that's a good example. Do that more, put more power in the states, and more states and local governments will be able to do that. How was it negotiating that with CMS as a Republican governor in the aftermath of the Supreme Court yeah. decision? I mean, it, it, many people, you're one of the few who actually did go in and, and offer an, an alternative. Well, I'm not a lawyer, and, and all due respect to the lawyers in the room, I don't typically care for lawyers much, but in this case, our attorneys, attorneys did a nice job of telling the attorneys in Washington that because of the Supreme Court's decision, we could do it. And they weren't hungry to do that. They didn't want to do that. What right. they were trying to do was force states into the Medicaid expansion, which I got to tell you, just on principle, I, I've asked fellow governors this, why is it that putting more people on Medicaid is a good thing? Why is it making more people dependent on the government on a good thing? I want to help lift people out of that. Not, not because we want to push them out into the streets, but because we want to empower people to control their own lives and their own destinies, particularly to the dignity that comes from work. And this empowered us to do this. But in, in the case of the federal government, actually, HHS, when we first announced this, I think within minutes, if I remember right, literally came out and said, you can't do this. I think it was a story in one of the publications here on the Hill, and we pushed back and had our attorneys point out that yes, we could do that, and within about 15 minutes to half an hour, they had changed the story because they realized legally we could, but it wasn't because of a whole lot of assistance to provide flexibility. Can I go back to, to something you mentioned a couple times, which mm -hmm. is uh, the importance of education, the training initiatives in Wisconsin, um, and the food stamps to educational training. Uh, workplace training. Um, where else would you like to do that if you could um, to make the safe net more work friendly? Well, we'd like to go the whole spectrum. We've started out with employability uh, training requirements, again, for adults without children, because you don't want to penalize kids uh, for the challenges of their parents. But for those without children, seeking, uh, we start out with a pilot, we're expanding it statewide to say you need to be enrolled in employability. The other thing I just introduced that'll be in my budget next Tuesday is adding to that 
not just for food stamps, for Medicaid and other areas where we will need federal government approval. So this is a great example of right. transfer power to us and look what we can do, uh, is uh, drug testing. To me, as I traveled my state, and I hear it increasingly when I tell this story around the country, I hear employers, small business owners all over who say, we have jobs. My state alone, this, yesterday there were more than 70,000 jobs listed just on our voluntary state website that were open in the state of Wisconsin. There are many examples like that across the country. But overwhelmingly, employers are not only telling us we need more skilled workers, which they do, but increasingly I hear from employers who say, you know what, it's great you put money in the technical colleges, apprenticeships, worker training programs, but we just need workers. And we need two things. We need people who know how to work. And I'm not talking about a skilled trade. I'm talking about people who know how to show up every day for work, five days a week, the kinds of things I mentioned. You know, as a kid, I learned working the countryside restaurant, uh, picking up dishes and doing dishwashing and flipping burgers at McDonald's. Those are things I think many of us learn that way. Well, unfortunately, not everybody in today's society has those basic employability skills, so that's a part of it. But the other part is I hear overwhelmingly in, in, in construction, in transportation, in manufacturing, in many ways in healthcare, employers who say, give me somebody who can pass a drug test, get them to show up for work, get them to pass a drug test, I can find a way to put almost anybody to work out there who's willing to work. And we want those kinds of reforms, but this is a classic example where the federal government HHS and other agencies tend to push back at the states and local governments and say, you can't do that. We need to open that up for innovation across America. I'm going to take a risk of uh, alienating my, uh, my partner here, Doug, and, and departing <laughs> to a different kind of area. Mm -hmm. um, you command the National Guard. You have the same security concerns and same fears, I'm sure, in your state and in, in your office that all of us do. Uh, I wonder if you might want to comment on how you feel about the threat posed by ISIS and other uh, enemies abroad and, 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 and how that impacts your state and what any thoughts you have on it. Yeah, no, that's a great question. The interesting thing with that is that, uh, you know, as a governor, not only do I and the other governors are the, chief, are the commanders in chief of our uh, National Guards at the state level, which is a distinct honor and privilege. I love going to welcome homes. I go to all deployments. But as a part of that, my adjutant general, the head of the Wisconsin National Guard, is also my chief homeland security advisor. And on a fairly frequent basis, he, uh, along with members of the FBI, give me and I presume other governors, uh, I, I tend to do on a frequent basis, security threat assessments. And so we go and get classified information, uh, important confidential information about threats not only in our state, but typically within our region across the country. Without violating the terms of any of those specifically, I just got to tell you that for my children, and others like them, uh, I see on an ongoing basis legitimate concerns about the threat to national security state by state and across this country. And it's one of the reasons why I've said repeatedly, one of the most important things we need out of our leaders in Washington, particularly our Commander-in-Chief here, is leadership. Affirmative, solid leadership that shows our allies we're willing to stand with them and shows even more importantly our adversaries uh, that we take their threat seriously. And to me it's not a matter of if, there's another attempted threat on American soil. It's a matter of when. Uh, for the sake of my children and other children and grandchildren like them, I want to make sure we take that threat to them and not wait for us. Mm. Um, if I was in a position to, 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 to manage that, I'd do everything in, I, in my power to make sure families across this country would sleep safe at night knowing they had someone who was looking out for their interest and their security. So that's a statement of priorities. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, you know, I, I'm a former CBO director, so it's always got to be a budget question here somewhere. Yeah. You balanced the budget, came in with big deficits. You've deposited twice now uh, funds into your rainy day fund mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. What do you see as the priorities in the budget, and where do you see the federal priorities as misplaced? Well, a couple different areas. In our case, maybe go for just a moment about what we did. Again, we tried to not take the false choices. Routinely in government here, sometimes even at the state and local level, there's this false choice between either you've, you've got to raise taxes or you've got to dramatically cut services. You talked about being a businessman. Where in business, young or old, businessman, businesswoman, you name it, where in business can you find someone successful who says times are tough, so I'm either going to double the price of my product or I'm going to cut the quality in half? Nobody does that, right? In, in the world uh, outside of government, nobody says that they figure out a way to balance cost and quality so that they find a way to be more efficient, deliver a high-quality uh, product at a reasonable cost out there. Yet in government, that's the false choice we're given. So when we came in, we said, we're not going to take that false choice. 
part of the reason why we enacted what's now called Act 10, those big reforms where we peeled back collective bargaining, empowered not only my state government, but all the local governments, through my experience of eight years as being a chief executive in, in county government, was I knew if we were freed of the big government union contracts, not only could we get more in pension and health care contributions, we could do things like bid out our health insurance, which school districts all across the state did and save tens of millions of dollars. We could do things like stop overtime abuse. We could empower innovation at the local level, which is precisely my argument at the federal level. We, we took a $3.6 billion budget deficit, turned it into a surplus. We balanced the budgets in each of the years I've been in office. We will do it again uh, this time around. And in the next budget I introduced Tuesday, we'll finish off with a, a balanced budget uh, that's financially sound as well. And along the way, as you mentioned, our rainy day fund's 165 times bigger than we took office. Our pension, our retirement system's the only one fully funded in the country. And we have made the tough decisions in our states that much better off because of it. In Washington, it's a matter of setting priorities. I think part of it is, for me, whether it's your local government with your fire and police or here in our, our federal government, it's got to be protect, uh, protection. It's about safety and security of all our American citizens and of those freedom-loving people around the world who share those values. Um, we can be responsible in doing that. That doesn't mean a blank check. But I think you can be responsible in doing that, make responsible, reasonable expectations of how to streamline the way that we provide that security through our Department of Defense and our other mechanisms out there. But I think that's got to be at your top of your list. And then for a good part of it, it goes back to the theme of what I mentioned. To me, to tackle many of these challenges, take money that otherwise is spent here or dictated from here and send it back to the states and to local governments where it's much more accountable uh, to the everyday taxpayer. I'll give you a couple examples. Think about Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Medicaid is an issue we've talked about many times before. You know, my friend Paul Ryan talked about in block grants. If we give that money back in other areas of health care to the states, what we do in Wisconsin is a lot different than New York or California or Texas or even Illinois. Why not empower innovators at the local and state level to do the things that are in the best interest of their taxpayers and are the best interest of the people that they're there to serve instead of this one-size-fits-all mentality? We have something, Doug, you've talked about for years. We're getting too wonky. We're talking about maintenance of effort. Why is it that a state or a local leader can't make an innovation without a federal regulation kick in that says you can't do that unless you kick certain people off of your program? Um, we were lucky because the Supreme Court, for your question, to be more innovative. But I look at that and say, I'd rather keep that money back at the state and local level. I look at transportation and say, instead of sending a dollar to Washington where they skim off cost and then send it back to me, why not keep that dollar back at the local level so you can fix that pothole out in front in a way that's the most cost effective and efficient possible. Why not say, when it comes to education, instead of sending that money here, why not keep that dollar back in your local community so that your local school board can put that money right into the classroom? I think there are so many examples out there that would help us not only balance the budget, in the end, it would avoid that false choice of between balancing the budget and giving up services. It would empower us to do it more effectively, more efficiently, and ultimately in a way that's more accountable at the local and state level. How much time do we have left? I have two questions, and I, I, I want to make sure I get the one done. You get a minute each. We have about two minutes left. Okay, Go. here's my question. It's, it's, it's really kind of off the policy area, but I think, it's, I think it's, it's important to me, and I think it might be important to others. Four years ago, you have two boys in public high school yeah. in Milwaukee. You're living in a house in Milwaukee. Tanette's living in that house. And in the state capitol, where you are, you are being invaded by the colleagues of the teachers and others who are responsible for your kids in school and thousands of others. And it's on national news. And six weeks before that, you were a county executive. And nobody, in the, nobody in the country knew anything about you. So all of a sudden, there it is. You're in, you're in there in your office. People are, are, are coming in in droves in protest. Your kids are in public school. How did you cope with that? How, how, how was that? Well, so thankfully, how, did you, how did you maintain your resolve? Well, there's no doubt family and faith played a big part of it. You know, certainly my faith had an impact in terms of um, uh, feeling called to run for governor in the first place and feeling that was, and for the right reasons. You mentioned my boys. Part of the reason why we got in that race early on, um, knowing it would be difficult, never dreaming it would be that difficult after the election, but knowing just the election itself would be difficult, was because we were worried back then uh, we had a $3.6 billion budget deficit, record job loss, 
double digit tax increases. We could see our state was headed in the wrong direction. We were worried that our sons were going to grow up in a state that wasn't as great as the one we grew up in. And so that's why we got in the race. And I think thankfully, because as a family, we had, we thought about it and prayed about it. Uh, our faith and our family and our circle of friends helped keep us focused. And you know, in the height of all this, when we had the death threats, not just against me, but the threats against my family. When we had the, the, the protests, not just in the Capitol or the governor's residence, but as you mentioned in our home outside of Milwaukee, our family home, we were able to sustain that because in the end, we knew we were doing the right thing. I, I kept saying over and over again to the lawmakers we were working in partnership with, we need to think more about the next generation than we do about the next election. And because of that, we not only won that battle, I think arguably the people of my state, a, a, a blue state, purple at best, ultimately saw not once but twice that in times of crisis what people want more than anything is leadership. We followed through on that leadership, but it wasn't easy. And, it, and it's part of the reason why we, you know, we've been able to take on additional big, bold reforms because we've been tested. We're able to handle it. Thank you. Um, as the founder of this lecture series, you get the final question. No, you, it's your turn. No, no. All right. Lawyers. Well, we didn't. Uh, we covered almost everything except the energy. Yeah. And um, you've got some wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. environmental uh, pluses in the state. Those beautiful lakes in Madison and, and the forest lake, mm -hmm. the forest you have, and, and the Great Lakes. Uh, and yet you have uh, policies coming out of Washington that might uh, be inimical to productive use of energy and productive use of resources and added regulation. Just be interested to hear your, your thoughts on the environment and, and energy and how you are handling some of these things coming out of Washington. You're right, both on energy and resource. It's interesting. We, we have, as you alluded to, we're the only state in the union that's surrounded by two great lakes and the greatest river in the country. We're filled with 15,000 inland lakes, 5,000 more than Minnesota, by the way, and all of ours have fish <laughs> in them. Um, so uh, it's a great place to be in and, and tremendous natural resources from one end of the state to the other, demographically and geographically, uh, very much a microcosm of America. Uh, and uh, we found a way to be both environmentally and economically sustainable. I often say the best way to be green is to make green or save green. If I can help find a way for people and employers to make money or save money while being environmentally sound, uh, that's the best way to be, to be green is to make it sustainable, both economically and environmentally. So Wisconsin's been a leader in many ways in that regard, but we're also very much challenged. Uh, we're challenged by what's being proposed here in Washington, uh, just like many other states across the country, particularly in the industrial Midwest, are heavy, uh, heavily dependent manufacturing states who, because of the ideas and rules that are being proposed out of this federal government, stand to see massive job loss and, and significant uh, rate increases for our hardworking people. And so this is one where one of my problems with this administration, amongst others, is they seem to think it's an either-or proposition. Either you can be environmentally sound or economically sound. I think it's one of those false choices where then you can do both. To me, that means having an all-the-above energy policy. It means embracing the resources we have not only here in America, but here in North America, where our allies are ready and willing, whether it's with the Keystone, uh, whether it's looking with industrial sand like we have in our state and the wide-opening shell deposits that we have. I think it's not only an economic issue. I think it is a national security issue because when you look at the prominence of people like Putin in Russia and others out there, part of his strength in the world is because of his resource asset and what he's doing to do that. If, if we were more aggressive, not only in providing our own means, but finding ways to export to other places around the world, we would diminish the impact of parts of the world that are a direct security threat uh, to our nation and our interest. And so I think we need leaders in Washington that stand up and say we want all the above, both for a strong economy as well as for a strong sense of safety. Well, um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank Fred Malik for his leadership at the American Action Forum, and I hope you'll join me in thanking the governor for an outstanding kickoff to the lecture series named after Fred. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Thank you.